Hallelujah. Don't you just love to hear the testimonies? Especially when it's somebody you know and you can relate. Can anybody relate to that tonight? Amen. How many believe God's already done miracles among us? Amen. Hallelujah. I believe God's already in the house. And I believe he's already doing amazing things. He doesn't need me to say it. You already know it. Amen. I just come to agree with what God's already doing inside of you. Hallelujah. What God is already speaking in this house. What God has already ordained for Trailhead Church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many are excited? All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, I just want to give honor tonight to um, Trailhead Church. To all of you precious ladies, thank you to everyone who has worked so hard. If you're not from Trailhead Church, give them a hand for inviting us here, allowing us to be part of this awesome conference, Rise Up Conference 2017. Amen. Hallelujah to the men who have served and the women in hospitality and worship. Isn't the worship awesome? Hallelujah. I want to thank Pastor Anna and Pastor Josh for the vision of this house. Amen. You are blessed with visionaries, people who have a heart for God, who are innovative of what God wants to do and where God wants to take this people. Amen. And where God wants to lead this house into and what God has called and ordained this house to do. How many know everybody doesn't have the same assignment? Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, God doesn't give everybody the same assignment and that's okay. Sometimes we think we have to fit, we have to do it like the neighbor does it, or we think we have to do it like somebody else does it. You do it like God ordained you to do it, all right? You be who God has called you to be. Hallelujah. And I'm always honored when I can and, uh, share the pulpit with Pastor Anna and Pastor Bonnie. Wasn't she awesome this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. We drove past a lingerie place on the way to lunch today, and I wanted to pull in. Morgan said, Mama, that's not the kind of lingerie place she's talking about. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. I'm kidding. Kind of. Kind of kidding about that. If you weren't here this morning, you missed that totally. That's all right. Somebody will explain that to you. How many are thankful for lingerie? (laughs) Hallelujah. At my house, a ratty old t-shirt or do. It really don't matter. But (laughs) Sorry, Morgan. You know, preacher's kids always love it when everybody gets it, when moms and pa- pastors always get up and tell all the secrets of the house, right? And they have been preaching to pastors here. But I am truly honored to be here with my daughter, Morgan. She is my pride and joy. I love her to the moon. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anytime we can sneak some time together, we're always excited to be together and she was going to kind of fake some contractions today so I could just stay in town for a little while longer, but I'm kidding. But how many know she's pregnant? And I am just about to get number four grandbaby, and I couldn't be happier, more excited. We got two granddaughters. We're going to have two grandsons, and God is good in the younger household. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm honored tonight to have my twin sisters here. I'm not a twin, but I have twin sisters, and they're in the house tonight. And the ladies and the ladies from Word of Deliverance are with me. We got to have bring some girls with us this time, and so we're excited. We're gonna have a little lake time at the at the lake house when we leave here and just some good old kickback and have some how many love belly giggles and belly laughs? Sometimes you gotta have some sister time and some laughs. And so I am excited. I tell people everywhere I go, and they'll tell you this, that some of the most powerful women I know are on that row right there. And I hope you feel the same way about the people in your house. But those ladies right there can move mountains, and I would not be who I am without them. And so I'm honored to have them come and sit with me tonight. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. So as I said, Morgan is pregnant, in case you didn't know that. It's a little bit hard to hide it right now, isn't it? And so we're excited to have a new baby anytime. And, uh, well, towards the end of the month, but you know, babies, they come when they're ready. They don't always get the memo, and so they, you know, whatever. So we're ready for that. 
And uh, so I'm planning to go with her for this delivery. It's going to be a whole lot more fun for me than it is for her, but that's all right, right? <laughs> we're going to pray her right through that, and we're going to believe for an easy delivery, and, and uh, we're just excited for happy, healthy babies. Amen? Yeah. But I say all to that, and, and I'm just giggling tonight because I, I love how God orchestrates things. And so this, this testimony of what she shared tonight could not be any more appropriate to let me just jump right in where I want to go. Because I want to talk tonight about rising up in expectancy. How many of you in here can raise your hand and say, I'm expecting some big things out of God? How many got some dreams in your heart? How many got some promises? How many got some things that you're expecting God to do? Anybody come to this house tonight expecting God to do supernatural things? See, I started praying in the last, I said, God, I want to see supernatural. I want to see signs, wonders, and miracles follow what we preach. We preach it. We believe it. We declare it. We know what the word says. I'm ready to see signs, wonders, and miracles manifested in the house of God. Are you ready for that? Hallelujah. I want God to burst something on the inside of me that is it's just supernatural. The seed of God that's inside of me and the seed that God wants to produce out of here. And what I felt like the Lord said to tell you tonight, and I'll jump ahead of myself, but God said to tell you that Trailhead Church is pregnant with purpose. <laughs> Trailhead Church is pregnant with purpose. Hallelujah. How many know there's a whole lot of process that happens in pregnancy? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You start out and it's great. I mean, you know, it's the glow and all of that kind of stuff. But how many know there's some trimesters and there's some stretching and there's some things. Sometimes your back hurts. Sometimes your feet swell. Sometimes your emotional mess. Sometimes pregnancy and all it's cracked up to be. But how many know, but for the joy that's set before us. That every mama can tell you every bit of pain, everything I went through was worth it. When I embraced and held my promise and my seed, hallelujah, had a really hard pregnancy with my first, or really not, not a hard pregnancy, I had a hard delivery with my first baby, my daughter Elizabeth. She's also my pride and joy. I love you, baby. <laughs> She's also my pride and joy. She's my worship leader, and um, she's blessed me with two beautiful babies, but I had a long delivery with her, and, and I'm one of those women that just don't dilate to the last moment, you know, kind of thing. And, and I remember being in labor, and I remember um, uh, the doctor wouldn't come in, and the nurse says, I'm just going gonna, gonna to call him up. I'm going to hand your husband the phone. You tell him anything you want to tell him. You know, it was kind of one of those things. And, and so finally the doctor comes in, he pats me on the leg, he said, I'm sorry, darling, you've been in false labor, but we're going to give you something to get you started. I said, kill me now, because I'm not going to make it through the real thing. If this is false labor, man, I, you know, kudos to everybody survived this, but I'm not going to make it. Long story short, she was born in about an hour. With a hematoma on the top of her head from the pressure trying to come through the womb. You know what I'm saying? The pressure was so strong because I wouldn't dilate that it raised up a hematoma on her head. How I many know sometimes when you're birthing something, there's some pressure there. There's some push there. There's some discomfort there. But if you'll hang on to the end and you'll push, when you feel that pressure, if you just go ahead and push through it, God wants to birth something out of you. It's going to look like Him. It's going to look like the Father. It's going to mimic who who he is and the seed of God is going to be birthed in the earth hallelujah I want to talk to you tonight about rise up in expectancy and being pregnant with purpose hallelujah so maybe when you leave here tonight if you need a good conversation starter with your husband just go home and tell him you're pregnant <laughs> with purpose <laughs> honey I got something to tell you and it came from God. <laughs> You're not going to believe it, but the angel showed up tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to go to, uh, before I get started and jump in all that, I'll preach my sermon before I get started and I'll be all right. In Isaiah 60, 1 through 6 in the Amplified Bible, it says, Arise from spiritual depression. I'm in the Amplified. Arise. How many know our theme is rise up? How many of you determine in your heart this weekend that I'm going to rise up out of some things? 
I'm going to get up and shake the dust off. I'm going to get up and shake myself. I'm going to stand up, put my big girl panties on. I'm going to put my boots on. I'm going to throw on a little makeup. I'm going to face the day because I'm tired of being where I've been. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to declare that today is the day that the Lord has made and I choose. I mean, sometimes you've got to choose to rejoice in it. Hallelujah. It's the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice in it. I choose to rejoice. I choose to bless the Lord. At all times, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I tell our folks all the time, you can't whine and complain it and you can't whine and praise at the same time. You can't speak in tongues and complain at the same time. You got to choose what comes out of your mouth because the power of life and death is in your tongue. And you speak it to yourself and you speak it to people around you. You speak it in your household. You speak it when your kids, when you speak defeat, they're defeated. When you speak hope, they have hope. Because when mama goes down, they know if mama goes down, it's all going down. How many know there's some real pressure on mamas today? We don't live it and leave it to beaver times. The times they are a changing. You are probably one of the most powerful forces on the earth at this time. Do you realize that? But it said, Arise. uh, King James says, Arise and shine, for the light has come. How many know sometimes I rise, but shining takes a little more effort out of me some days? Some days I don't have my sparkle. And you, you say, well, Pastor Lisa, you're a pastor. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm just going to tell you flat out, some days I rise. But shine takes a little more caffeine. It takes a little more B-complex sometimes. I had one of those days not too long ago. I take B-complex. I swear by it. It gives me energy. It helps my moods. Every woman in here should take it. If you don't get you a bottle, I believe it's of God. I believe it's anointed. Hallelujah. I pray over B-complex. My ladies will tell you, I live by it. Not too long ago, I had one of those mornings and we'd lay our vitamins out. I have a wonderful husband. Bless my husband. Hallelujah. He's home. He sends your greetings. Um, He fixes my breakfast every morning. When I come up, the coffee is made. I have bacon and eggs, toast. It's made for me before I go to work in the morning. I work in a kindergarten. (laughs) You feel the anointing on that? Hallelujah. I work in a kindergarten class and he probably thinks that's the least he could do for me before I get there. He's a great man, but he makes my coffee every morning and he takes good care of me. And we lay our vitamins out and we take our vitamins in the morning and, and um, you know, we get them all gathered up. And he said, honey, you laid out to be complex. I said, I know. Because <laughs> this is going to be a to be complex kind of day. Sometimes you just have those days. Hallelujah. But the scripture said, arise and shine. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Hallelujah. Arise out of the spiritual depression to a new life. I mean, no, you can be spiritually depressed. I mean, no, you can be mentally depressed, physically depressed, financially depressed, pushed down. Hallelujah. And I dare say that probably mental anguish is more painful than physical pain. If you've ever dealt with depression, if you ever know what it's like to really be deal with anxiety and depression and things like that, it can be very disconcerting. It can be very controlling. But it says, the scripture says, arise from spiritual depression to a new life and shine. Be radiant with the glory and brilliance of the Lord for your light has come. And the glory... And the brilliance of the Lord has risen upon you. For in fact, another translation says, Though darkness will cover the earth. Hang on, I'm touching buttons and I don't know what I'm touching here. (laughs) And deep darkness will cover the people, but the Lord will rise upon you, Jerusalem. And His glory and His brilliance will be seen on you. Nations will come to your light And kings, to the brightness of your rising, lift up your eyes around you and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from far away. And your daughters will be looked after at their side. Then you will see and be radiant. And your heart will tremble with joy and rejoice. Because the abundant wealth of the seas will be brought to who? 
to you. Say me. me. Hallelujah. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels from the eastern trading tribes will cover you, Jerusalem. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba who once came to trade, will come bringing gold and frankincense and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. Somebody say the camels are coming. And they're bringing treasures. They're bringing the, the, the spoils. They're bringing the goodness. The scripture says that nations will arise and will be drawn to you. Hallelujah. How many in here still believe God's in control? God's still in control of our nation. God's still con in control of whatever chaos seems like it's going around you. How many know you are salt and light? If there's darkness around you, shine. Shine, baby, shine. Stand up and be a light in a dark place. Be salt and be light. Hallelujah. But how many know some days it takes a little bit more to, to uh, arise and shine? Amen? But it says that your sons and your daughters will come to you. Do you know that your sons and daughters will live in the world that you frame with your words? Let me say that again. Your sons and daughters will live in the world that you frame with your words. If you believe God is still on the throne and you declare that over them, then that's what they're going to believe. If you believe in gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark, depression, excessive misery, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. You know the song. Any Hee Haw fans in here? <laughs> gloom, despair, and agony on me. And how many know sometimes that's our song? That's what we pre preach out of our mouth. We know what the Word says. But sometimes to get our heart and our minds to come into agreement and know what the Word says and stand and not be shaken. We're not shaken by external forces. Hallelujah. How I many know we're driven by the light inside of us? The day star on high. Hallelujah. So how I many know we can rise up in expectancy? We can rise up in hope. Is there anybody in here expecting tonight? Amen. Some of you physically are. Thank God for that. Amen. Some of you'd like to be. Some of us are glad we're past that part. Thank you, Jesus. I've been chasing Spider-Man all around the kitchen, and we've been playing with swords and weapons and all kinds of things, and I'm saying, this is why you have babies when you're young. <laughs> Hallelujah. But how many know they're, they're, they're more fun second time around? Am I right, Pastor Bonnie? They're more fun second time around. Hallelujah. We all survived at our house, but thank God for grandchildren. But first of all, I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about how Sarah got her laugh back. How many know Sarah's name means princess? How many of you in here believe you're a princess? Your father's the king. If you don't believe it, you need to know it. You need to know how much favor you have. How many know Esther didn't know the power she had to even go into the king? When Mordecai asked her to go... She said, you, you don't realize it doesn't work that way. Unless he calls me, I don't get to go in. Unless he puts out his scepter, he said, and he said to her, but, but don't, you don't know that perhaps this is the moment for which you've been created. Maybe this is the moment who God has brought you to the palace for such a time as this. And she said, I'll go. You get everybody fasting and praying for me. And then we're going to go in. And if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to see the king. But what happened is she did not know how much power she had with the king. She did not know how much her king loved her. She did not know how much favor she had with the king. Some of us in here tonight need to realize how much favor we've got with the king. I don't care where you've been. I don't care where you come from. You are still a king's kid. Your father is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And you can adjust your crown and straighten it up and put on your cape and let her go. Hallelujah. I, told, I might have told this story here before. My granddaughter is a big Frozen fan. Any Frozen fans in here? So I made her a cape one year for Christmas. And uh, she had a crown and she had a pair of click clacks. And she would come to my house and she would put her click clacks on and she put her crown on. And then she would put this cape and she'd start to run. And she would say she felt like a princess when she put a crown on. She, she got dressed, Pastor Anna. She clothed herself with some things that made her feel special. It made her feel like a princess. But when she would run, her cape wouldn't fly. 
And she got upset. And I said, baby, why are you crying? And she said, my cape won't fly. And I said to her, your cape is never going to fly if you keep turning around. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to let the daughters of the king know your cape is not going to fly if you keep turning around. You need to set your face of flint. You need to put your face and run, baby, run and let it go. Let it go. Hallelujah. And I said, baby, if your cape won't fly, I'll hold it. You run and we'll make it happen. How many know sometimes you got to get somebody to grab your cape for you and tell her, run, baby, run and let it go and don't look back and don't go back to where you used to be, but put your crown on, put your cape on and run. And I'll hold your cape if you need me to. I mean, one of the most powerful things that happens in women's conferences is that just that we're together. We are connected. Let me tell you, women need each other. We can't go to the bathroom by ourselves. <laughs> My husband says, why can't you go to the bathroom by yourself? I said, for, for one thing, somebody got to hold your purse. Or you got to sit it on that nasty ground. I don't know what's been on that nasty ground. And then I get in there. And my toilet paper roll's empty. Who's going to who's gonna hand me toilet paper from the other stall if I don't take one of my girls with me? And then I might need some lipstick while I'm in there or somebody to make sure my skirt's not tucked in my pantyhose. You men, you just don't understand those things, right? Hallelujah. In Genesis 18, verse 9. Through the, not, verse 9 through 15. I'm going to read it from the Message Bible. This is the story of Sarah. How many are, how many are glad Sarah got her laugh back? Yeah. She got her groove back. And her name means princess. Genesis 18, 9 through 15 says, The men said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, In the tent. One of them said, I'm coming back about this time of year. When I arrive, your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. Somebody say menopause. <laughs> far past the age for having babies. And Sarah laughed. <laughs> Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband? Sweet Jesus. God said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, me have a baby, an old woman like me? Is anything too hard for God? I want you to say that with me tonight. Is anything too hard for God? I'll be back about this time next year and Sarah will have a baby. Sarah lied. She said, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. But he said, oh, yes, you did. You laughed. I mean, are glad Sarah got her laugh back. Because here's what happens. Barrenness will steal your joy. An empty womb will steal your joy. And that's whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual. But how many know sometimes our spiritual barrenness is way more painful even than physical barrenness? And each one equally barren. Each one equally hard. But how many know the first time she laughed, she laughed cynically? Yeah. Have you seen Abraham? Because our tent smells way more like Ben Gay these days than it does Chanel number no. five. It ain't been happening like it used to be happening. That word menopause means men on pause. If you men are in here tonight, take that note, write that down. She'll be back. She'll be back. And how many know sometimes just got to men just got to go on pause? Because when the hot flashes or the power surges come, how I many know there's a whole lot of things happening in your body in menopause? Come on, ladies. It's not for the faint of heart. There's a whole lot of things happening in your body when you're, when you're in pregnancy. Hallelujah. They call them hormones. I call them her moans. Because her just moans all the time. Sometimes. Hallelujah. But first she laughed in doubt, and secondly, then she laughed in faith. 
But here's a thought that struck me today. If you think it's funny for a 90-year-old woman to give birth to a baby, just think what terrible twos look like at the age of 92. <laughs> Jesus, do you love me or not? <laughs> How many know sometimes when you're in that place, you feel like your day has passed you by? And there's women in this place tonight, you feel like, you know what, I hear everything you're saying, but there is nothing happening inside of me. I feel empty. I feel broken. I feel like nothing is happening and my day has passed me by. You can say that because you didn't come from where I came from or you don't know what I've been through. I mean, a barrenness can come at a whole lot of levels. And as much as Sarah wanted to believe for it, it looked like her day had passed her by. It looked like it was not going to happen for her. And everything she had produced up to that point out of her own efforts is an Ishmael. I mean, sometimes we try to force God's hand and we try to make God do the plan of what we think we want done in our lives. And all it does is produce an Ishmael but not the seed of promise. But when God gives you a promise, when God wants to burst something in your heart, when he gives you a vision and said, Abraham, I'm telling you, your seed is going to be at the sands of the sea and the stars of the heaven. I'm going to do something supernatural out of your loins, out of your womb. I am going to birth the nations of the earth. How many know somebody needs to stand up and pay attention and say, God, I don't know what you want to do in me, but it might change the nations of the earth, the dream and the desire you placed in me if you deposited the seed of God in me if you have birthed a dream if you have caused something to be planted inside of me then I trust you to bring it to pass everything that you want to do in me bring it to bring it to pass and how many know laughter birthed laughter Isaac's name means laughter Because she said, because God caused me to laugh. Aren't you glad Sarah got her laugh back? You know, there is nothing uh, more therapeutic. They said that that a laugh, a belly laugh, is like an inside jogging. It's like jogging on the inside. It'll get your heart rate up. It'll relax your muscles. It is therapeutic. The scripture says a merry heart does good like a medicine. And our kids back home, the youth said, we want Pastor Lisa about 11 o'clock at night. And we're going to play a game of spoons. And we want to see her just fall apart and laughter. Because something happens after 11 o'clock, I get silly. And then I start laughing and I can't stop laughing. And so they want to they want to get in youth camp. They want to wait till I'm wore out sitting on the floor about midnight. And then they want to party. Because they know I'm going to tell secrets. I'm going to get laughing. I'm going to get silly. And it's going to be a party in the house. But how many know there is nothing more therapeutic than a baby belly laugh? Have you ever just had a baby just gets that giggle? And you can't help but laugh. You can't help but giggle with them. How many know I think we need some laughter? I love, I love silly. I love these videos. Thank you for singing tonight. Next year I say we do a duo. We'll do it together, right? Hallelujah. I love silly because sometimes we take ourselves way too serious. But laughter is contagious. It'll catch on. It's healing. But your barrenness sometimes steals your joy. When there's an emptiness in your heart, an emptiness in your womb, it'll steal your joy. And it'll cause you to second guess God. And it'll cause you to think that the promises of God are not for you or that they've passed you by or that it's never going to happen to you. Hallelujah. And I can just see Sarah hanging out in the tent saying, what did he say? What did he say? Did he say what I thought he said? (laughs) Hallelujah. Because how many know sometimes, I I like to refer to him like this, God is Jehovah Sneaky. (laughs) Every now and then he just sneaks in and does something crazy and out of the ordinary and drops a favor bomb. And I love it. I love when Jehovah Sneaky drops a favor bomb in your life. And you don't even see it coming. Right? And God just does the miraculous and he starts to stir up things inside of you. But one of my favorite all-time scriptures in the Bible, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 1. And I know it's not Christmas, but we're going to go here anyway. But in Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to read a good bit of scripture here. But I love 
the story. And we always hear the story of Mary and, and you know, the, the Immaculate Conception and the visitation of the angel and how wonderful that was and, and how God came to her. But preceding that, there was a pretty powerful miracle that happened even before Mary had a visitation. And it was a visitation that came in, in Luke 1, chapter, um, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless, but they had no child. How I many you know these are people who believe God? They walk with God. They're ministering in the temple. They got it going on, but there's still something lacking in them. How I many you know the most spiritual among us sometimes has moments of deficit? Moments when you just feel like you've been sucker punched, or moments when you just feel like, wow. You know, I just didn't see that one coming. But how many know the scripture says, but they were, had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. The name John means grace. And now you're going to be graced with a son called John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor straw drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his, other, his mother's womb. How many believe your children can be filled with the Holy Ghost in the mother's womb? Hallelujah. Pray over them babies. Plead the blood. Hallelujah. Put it on the doorpost. I've anointed my kids' bedroom doors. I've anointed their cars. I've anointed their, our house. We've prayed over our house. When sickness would come, I'd just say, I anoint this house. And when the death angel wants to pass over, it's going to have to find another address because you don't belong here. Hallelujah. And he said, even from his mother's womb, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall be go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom to the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad things. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, in his, after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus saith the Lord, thus, thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now, the scripture tells us an angel shows up to Zechariah and tells him, Zechariah, your prayers have been answered. And so if I said that to you tonight, what would you say? You say amen? I would say which one? Because if you're like me, I got more than one out there. I got prayers that I want to be answered. You know, we don't know. Zechariah gets to serve in the temple for about two weeks. One time in his life, and they just about draw straws to find out who's going to do it. And he gets to go into the, whole, the holy place where no one else but the priest can go. And all of a sudden, in the presence of God, right there before the altar of incense and the table of the showbread and the candlelight, all of a sudden, God shows up. How many know when you put yourself in a posture of praise and worship and find your prayer closet and your secret praise, God's going to show up? 
And God begins to show up and he said, your prayers have been answered. And your wife Elizabeth, is he's in there to offer the prayers of the people. But how many know sometimes when you're praying for everybody else's things, God just sneaks in and does something miraculous for you in the meantime. And so he said, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And he's like, have you been to my house? Have you seen my wife Elizabeth? And so he, God begins to speak to him and he begins to say great things. And the scripture says, and he questioned the angel. And so he was dumb and could not speak. I dare say, had it been me, I would have been not had anything to say. Because how many know a lot of times we question what God starts to say to us because we say, how in the world, God, are you going to do the supernatural in a situation that looks like it's barren? It looks like it's dead. It looks like it's hopeless. And what he does is silence men's voices so they can't say anything contrary. How many know sometimes we need to silence the voices that are wanting to speak anything contrary than what God is saying? Hallelujah. How many know there are some dumb men out there? Now let me qualify that. I don't mean that in a negative sense. But how many know sometimes, girls, your husband don't know what to say to you? They don't know how to explain what's going on. They don't know what you're going through. Because when you have issues, they say, are you upset? You say, no. (laughs) Are you mad at me? No. They know you are. My husband will say, honey, if, if you want me to figure this out, I'm not. Just tell me. Just say it, what you want me to say. How many know they don't always know how to, when I say they're dumb, they don't always know how to articulate. How many know men don't always know how to articulate what God wants to do in the midst of you? But I love this. So he's got about two weeks now before he gets home to go tell Elizabeth what God wants to do. And he gets there and he can't talk to her. No sweet whisperings in her ear. No romantic sayings because he is speechless. He can't talk. So he says... She says, <laughs> you and me, we're going to have a baby. Probably some of you, Elizabeth, said, don't tease me. Don't promise me something that I've desired, and yet it's not happened. And the scripture says, here's one of my favorite parts about it. Elizabeth hides herself for five months. She hides herself for five months. Why? So nobody can talk me out of what God is about to do in me. I mean, you've got to be careful who you share your vision with and who you share your dream with sometimes. Because people talk you right out of the promise of God in your life. So she hides herself. Let me tell you, ladies, they didn't have those little strips that you pee on. They didn't do blood tests. They didn't even have a gynecologist office. They didn't do ultrasounds. You only found out that you're going to have a baby. How did you all realize you were going to have a baby? Your visitor didn't show up one month, right? You skipped your period, right? I'm just being real plain. We're all women. We got this, right? But if you've done going through the change, you're old. You're not having them anymore. How do you know there's something happening inside of you unless you see it start to grow out of you? But here's what happens. In about her fifth month is about the time that a baby starts to move. See, you can talk me out of it for probably four months, maybe up to the fifth month, but when I feel something start to move inside of me, when I feel something start to take on life, when I start to feel something that's moving, something's shaking, something's changing, you can't talk me out of it anymore. And here's what happens. The angel shows up at the house of Mary and gives her the same story. Now, it's just as crazy for Mary because she's about to plan the big wedding. She's got the dress. She booked the venue, and she's ready to get married. And God steps right in the midst of everything you've got planned and said you're about to be overshadowed with the Holy Ghost and you're going to birth the Messiah. And she says, how can these things be? Because I don't know a man. I don't know why she didn't get struck dumb. 
I don't know why she wasn't speechless. I think it's because God knows women need to know these things. We got to know I have a need to know. And so he says, you're going to have a baby. And here, here, Mary, guess what? It's not just you. You want to hear something crazy? Your cousin Elizabeth, she's going to have a baby too. And her response is, be it unto me according to your word. Whatever it is you want to do in me, Lord, you go ahead and do it. So when you get up off your knees from there, you go tell your fiancé who wants to put you away privately because you're breaking all the rules. What do you do? What am I going to do? God is birthing something so big, so powerful, so supernatural in me, and I don't know what to do with it. But wait a minute. I've heard. i got another sister. I heard there's an Elizabeth that God wants to do something in her. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to connect myself with somebody that God's doing the same thing. I'm going to go connect with my sisters. I'm going to find out what God's saying to you. I'm going to put myself in a posture because if God said crazy to you and he said crazy to me, we're just going to do crazy together. How about that? We're going to do crazy together. She packs her bags. She gets her donkey. She goes to the house of Elizabeth. And before she knocks on the door, the scripture says she salutes Elizabeth. And the scripture says at the sound of her salutation. Let me tell you, ladies, the words of your mouth are powerful. And when she began to speak to Elizabeth, 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 it's Mary. I don't know if you know it or not, but I had a visitation. God's going to burst something inside of me. Elizabeth, I come to connect with you. And here's what happened. Elizabeth says, and at the sound of your salutation, you cause my baby to leap. You cause my baby to come alive. I may not have been convinced on the fourth month or the fifth month or the sixth month, but on the manner of your salutation, when you cause my baby to leap, there's no doubt about it beyond a shadow of a doubt. God is birthing in me a supernatural thing. And behold the mother of my Lord that he has brought to me. And God is going to do great things. And how many know they had, Sister Bonnie, a Holy Ghost party? They had a Holy Ghost party. Because here's what's got to happen. When I come to Trailhead Church in North Carolina to see my daughter and to connect with women who are hearing crazy things that God wants to birth in them. Because I come because I want to hear your salutation because when you begin to declare the goodness of the Lord, it causes my baby to leap. It causes something inside of me to come alive. And you could have talked me out of it maybe before. See, in that first month or so, you think, I don't know, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. You go buy a second one and a third one, and, and then you do a blood test. And, and then somewhere about the fourth month, you think, oh, I, I can't change my mind. There's no going back on this. We're in this for the long haul. Amen? And when the back starts to hurt and when all the pressure, hallelujah, but here's what I love about this. The scripture says that Mary stayed with Elizabeth three months. Now it said in about the sixth month, Mary went to visit her. Elizabeth hid herself for five months. Six months, Mary shows up. Baby starts moving. Baby starts to leap. You caused my baby to come alive. But the scripture says that she abode with her for three more months. How many months does it take to birth a baby? Because here's what's going to happen. I'm not going home until I lay my eyes on what God has promised you. I will hold in my hands your promise. And I will help you birth your promise so that I can believe God for what he wants to do in my heart. Let me tell you, sometimes you got to stand with somebody and say, I will stand with you and I will watch you birth the promise of God, even waiting on mine to come. But I will stand and embrace that baby in my arms. And when I do and look in the face of your promise, I'll know that my God is big enough to do it for me too. And if he did it for you, he can do it for me. 
Hallelujah. We stand together and we declare that if God will do it for you, he'll do it for me and he'll do the supernatural and I'll embrace your baby. And I'll look in the face of grace, in the face of John. Hallelujah. When they go back to the temple and they want to dedicate that baby, he says his name's going to be called John. And they said, you can't name him John. There's nobody in the family named John. How many know everybody else wants to call your baby, wants to name your baby? And they might name you forsaken. They might name you barren. They might name you broken. They might name you uh, all kinds of things. But you don't call it what you want to call it. You call it what God calls it. What God names it. What God births and what God purposes. Hallelujah. Maybe Elizabeth had the faith to believe because she knew the testimony of Sarah. If Sarah can have a baby in an old age, just maybe it could happen for me. If God can birth something in me in this stage right here in my life. I don't know our age span here tonight. Pastor Bonnie's going to live to nine, or to 100. I'm sorry. She's going to live to 100. I'm just going to pray blessing over her womb in Jesus' name. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Hallelujah. <laughs> She's going to pray twins on me then, right? <laughs> I have a pastor friend. She will be celebrating her 101 birthday this month. I went to her birthday party. She wore her high heels. She wore her makeup, her pearls, and her gold dress, and she owned that place. Let me tell you, I believe the saints of God can stand up and rise up in health and glory and see the salvation of God and know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm not just talking about natural wombs, and I believe God will move on natural wombs. And some of you guys in this house want God to do that tonight, and we believe in God for that. Amen? Can we just say, God, I believe you for that supernatural right now in Jesus' name. Supernatural. Hallelujah. And so she might have had the faith to believe because Sarah dared believe. How many of you sometimes you're, you daring to believe for something might cause somebody else to have the faith to believe? Also, hallelujah. I'm going to uh, skip on down to Luke chapter 8. I'll have a, we'll go to there. Luke chapter 8 and verse 41 tonight. Now, I mean, I believe that even in the picture of Elizabeth and Mary, we see God bringing the old and the young together. I love generational church. I love the wisdom of the old, the strength, the experience of the old. Sometimes it would do us good to sit down and listen to our elders and learn some things from them. And I love the energy of the youth. We have those that come into our church, we call them the sons of thunder when they come rolling in. They come in with thunder, they go out on the cloud. They're just like, it's like lightning and thunder when they're together. And, and I love the energy. I love when our kids get up to go back through the, through the, the aisleways for Sunday school class and it sounds like chaos breaking out. I never want to go to church and not have that sound. Amen? I love the sound of the old and the young coming together. Hallelujah. And so we pray on them as they go back through there. Lord, I, I, I pray over their Sunday school teachers. I pray over everyone that is imparting in their life tonight or today. And I pray that you cause these kids to know they are anointed and appointed. They are called in purpose. They are ordained for such a time as this. Amen. They're not the church of the tomorrow. They're the church of today. Generational church. How many of God's plans sometimes stretch you? Anybody ever been stretched? Hallelujah. But in Luke chapter 8 and verse 41, it says, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, but as he went, the people thronged him, and a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, could neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and, and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is going out of me. 
And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her daughter, my daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I want to stop there for just a minute. I mean, Jesus is on his way to the house of Jairus because there's a little girl, 12 years old, who's dying. And this woman has had an issue of blood for 12 years. I believe there's a parallel. And it says that as he's going along, the crowd is so pressing him. And you know that in Leviticus it says that if you had an issue of blood from your body, you literally had to go around saying, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. Don't touch me. Don't sit where I've sat. Don't lay where I've laid. Intimacy is out of the question. Childbearing is out of the question. If, if, if you have an issue of blood, you literally had to segregate yourself from people. And you had to say, if they came too close to you, I'm unclean. How many know, ladies, five days is a long time for an issue of blood? Seven days is a long time for an issue of blood. Twelve years is way too long. To be in that cycle. Because when she's in that cycle, there is no room for intimacy. There is no room for birthing. There is no... And what happens is she doesn't even feel like she's worthy to touch Jesus. She doesn't feel like she has the right under the law to touch him. But today's the day I'm so desperate, Pastor Anna. I'm so desperate for something different than the way I've been living. I'm so desperate to change what's been happening in me. I'm going to cast caution to the wind. I'm going to elbow my way in. And I'm just going to sneak in and see if by chance I could just touch the hem of his garment. Because if I touch the hem, I won't make him unclean. And I'll just chance it and maybe I'll get my healing. And she dives in and she reaches and she grabs a hold of just the very skirt of his garment. And when she does, something supernatural happens. Let me tell you, when you get desperate enough for Jesus, when you get desperate enough to touch him, when you get desperate that you don't care what people say, you don't care what you look like, but you can't live any longer like you've been living, and you push your way in, all of a sudden when you catch a hold of something supernatural, the earth begins to shake, and Jesus stops the procession, parts the crowd, and says, Who touched me? And she, hoping that she would not be discovered, crouches down and lays there. And Peter says, like, what, Lord? What do you mean, who touched you? We have been defending you like linebackers, trying to hold people back from you because everybody in this town wants to touch you. What do you mean, who touched me? No, somebody connected with me on a supernatural level because I felt virtue flow out of my body. Can I tell you the flow of his blood is way more powerful than the issues of your blood and that if you ever really touch Jesus you're going to find out your issues are dried up. Your issues are healed. If ever there's a church and a people that need godly women to stand up without issues and just cast caution to the wind and press in and touch Jesus it's now. It's now. It's right now. Hallelujah. And she reaches in and she touches him. And he said, I felt something leave my body. I felt virtue. I felt something supernatural connect tonight. And he said to her daughter, go in peace. Thy faith hath made you whole. For the first time in 12 years, there was peace in her life. Peace in her soul. Peace in her mind. Peace in her body. And peace in her womb. Hallelujah. But here's the deal. There's still a 12-year-old girl dying at the house of Jairus. And so while we're all hung up on all of our issues, there's a generation waiting on godly women. While we're held up on our issues and not sure whether we need to press in or get in there, there's a generation dying waiting on Jesus. But here's what I love about Jesus he can reach over and touch the hand of a woman who's got issues and reach over and touch the hand of a 12 year old maiden 
And the same power that heals the, heals the issues of that woman who had the issue of blood is the same power that will heal a generation, that will raise up our daughters, that will raise up our seed, that will cause them to rise up and eat and be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. How many he goes into the room and he said, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed. Somebody say, laugh, laugh. laugh, laugh. Sarah got her laugh back. He said, He's, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed. And he said, I'll tell you what you do, put the mockers out. Shut the door to the unbelief. Shut the door to everybody who does not believe. Shut the door to everybody who laughed. Because it might look like this generation is dying. You might be, the news media might be confessing over our kids and over our generation that they're dying. But I'm going to tell you they're asleep and they need somebody. Stand up, wake up, rise up. Hallelujah. They're not dead, they're asleep. And they're waiting on the church to be healed of their issues so we can rise up, stand up, and be made every whit whole. Do you believe that tonight? My cry is not for just myself. I don't want to just make heaven my home. I want to make my home like heaven. I'm not just worried about me for getting a ticket to there. I want my generations to have a more powerful anointing, a more greater experience than, they, than I've ever had. My cry is for the generations yet to come to wake up to who God has called them to be, to be powerful, anointed women. Our scripture said in the beginning, your sons and your daughters are going to come. Some of you are believing in here tonight for your sons. Some of you are believing for your daughters. Some of you are confessing things over your kids. I'm here to tell you tonight, they're not dead. They're not dead. They're not dead.